Hello and welcome to the first episode in a new season of Harney's Expert Review Podcasts. My name is Aki Khorsoni Hussein, and I'm the Global Head of Harney's Regulatory and Tax Practice. Expert Review aims to deliver bite-sized opinions and analysis on key global governance, regulation, and tax issues of importance to our clients and the wider community. Each episode features a guest speaker, is unscripted, and intends to give listeners food for thought based on trends that we see from daily practice. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Rachel Barnes, King's Council at Three Raymond Buildings in London. Hello, Rachel. Aki, hello. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for being here, Rachel. So first to properly introduce our guest, Rachel is recognised as a leading practitioner in sanctions and financial crime and acts for national and international companies and individuals in complex cross-border jurisdictional and state immunities matters. Rachel is dual qualified in the US and the UK, in England and Wales, and started practice in New York in 1999. She remains admitted to practice there with significant experience of cases involving the SEC, OFAC, the DOJ, and congressional inquiries. In the UK, Rachel was called to the bar in 2004 and made silk in 2022. In short, a true expert. Cutting to the chase, in this podcast, we focus on the state of play as at June 2023 regarding sanctions on Russia and as we approach nearly a year and a half following the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Our last podcast on this topic was held back in February 2022, which feels like a very long time ago in the sanctions world. And it's fair to say that we've all been so incredibly busy in the meantime. So, Rachel, as you and I have worked together on on a number of cases in the past, uh, stretching back many years, and you've been advising on both the UK and US sanctions regimes for those years. How have you found that our industry has changed since February 2022 and those events in Ukraine? Well, Aki, I think the biggest change we've seen since February 2022 until now, June 2023, is just the sheer volume of work that we've all been doing, and I'm sure our listeners have too. The extent to which sanctions issues have permeated so much of both the commercial legal world and compliance legal world, as well as regulatory and increasingly enforcement actions. But also, I think what we're seeing is just the complexity of the problems that are arising are also really significant. And the uncertainty, particularly in commercial context, as to exactly where the lines are drawn and where the parameters of the sanctions, prohibitions and restrictions lie. I think that's absolutely right, Rachel. I mean, I think certainly our experience is is that um, with Russia being such a key important stakeholder in you know historically over the last 20 30 years and then suddenly to have this you know sword of you know sanctions drop onto onto the industry has has, has been truly something to grapple with and has meant that it, exactly as you say that that sanctions has, has become a really pervasive area for 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 all sorts of practitioners not just those that focus like you and I do on on, on sanctions um so yeah. no, I, f- I fully agree with that I think also, Aki, I mean, you and I have gone back years where previously many of our issues for European and UK businesses or or those outside the US was having to focus on the extent to which the US sanctions might affect them. Another big, big change is that it's not simply the US being the only player in town, the extent of the EU and uh, UK sanctions has increased massively over the past year or so. And so there are real enforcement risks coming out of the the regimes in those jurisdictions, not just the US. Absolutely. I I couldn't agree more with that. So turning back the clock a little bit to to 2014, and and those are the days of, of Obama and a lot of cooperation between the US on the one side and the EU, which at that point in time included the UK, uh, on the other. And there was a lot of cooperation following the actions of, of Russia, the destabilizing effects that, that Russia was taking in, in Crimea and, and the Donbass. And do you think that that level of cooperation has been the same this time around? Or have you seen uh, on, on, on the legislation side, is your experience that there, there are now, you know, it's, it's all a little bit patchwork and, and quite, quite distinct? I think the issue of cooperation and overlap between the EU, UK and US on sanctions is really interesting if you look at it historically over time. It ebbs and flows as the US and the 
EU stroke UK policies align and then move apart. And we've seen that with Russia, as you say. In 2014, one saw that meeting of minds between the US and the EU and the extensive cooperation. And then over the next six years, we saw increasing divergences again in, in respect to Russia, particularly in the latter part when you had ramping up of the US sanctions compared to some of the EU measures and the threats in the US of the application of secondary sanctions, US secondary sanctions against EU persons who were involved in Russian commercial ventures and that whole debate around the Nord Stream pipeline, Nord Stream 2 pipeline and uh, players, actors in the US saying that if the e EU didn't shut it down, the US needed to do so through its sanctions measures. But that divergence was largely swept away again come February 2022 with a much greater alignment between what are now the three jurisdictions post-Brexit, so US, EU and UK. And so indeed, in many respects, I think we've seen the UK and the EU sanctions have sometimes been even broader than the US ones as regards Russia. We see that particularly in relation to the listings of individuals and entities. The EU and the UK has listed certain Russian or well, high profile Russian businessmen that say the US has not. We are seeing, albeit greater alignment, there are still divergences. And what an area I think will be very interesting to see is the approach of the three jurisdictions to sanctions enforcement. And again, whether we see divergences, I mean, traditionally we have, US has been the leader on sanctions enforcement, it's been the sanctions policeman of the world, but we are, I think, going to see increasing enforcement actions within EU member states, or at least some of them, as well as in the UK. I th I, yeah, I think that, that, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and I think certainly what we're seeing is that there is an acknowledgement that this block of three of, of the US, EU, UK is the world benchmark now, and certainly as far as Russia sanctions is concerned. And I also fully agree that Europe, in a broader sense, uh, so, so including the UK, certainly has more skin in the game, so to speak, as, as regards Russia, and is more of a driving force there. Yeah, I mean, with, with that, of course, with Europe and, and indeed some of the UK overseas territories, etc. Aki, you and your firm have advised in a number of those strategic sort of hubs for Russian business. And it's interesting, I think, to hear your experience of what sanctions enforcement will be like in those countries. So I think our experience there has been, so looking at Europe first, I think comparing the block of three there, the UK, US and, and Europe, in regards of real prosecutions for sanctions breaches, I, I would say that the EU member states are probably lagging behind a little bit. We There was still, up until quite recently, some disagreement as to whether a sanctions breach would in fact be a criminal offence in some member states. Um, that issue has now broadly been put to bed, but we're still sometimes even asked that question. In Cyprus, it's been a criminal offence since 2016, and arguably even before then. But I think beyond that, there has been a, a general slowness at bringing prosecutions and real proper enforcement, as we see it, in, in sanctions cases. But, but that's not to say that, that lots of activity is occurring behind the scenes. And I think recently, and, 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 and again, looking at Cyprus, you know, that, that's very much in the... In, in, in the spotlight when it comes to Russia uh, as, a, as a key international hub. And I think in terms of soft enforcement of regulators going round to, to trust companies and ensuring that policies are in place, ensuring that uh, stakeholders are aware of what the penalties are for breaches, that is, that is certainly something that we have seen a lot of. And, and it's certainly important that, that, that stakeholders do have those, uh, all of those policies that they are taking the right decisions and they are complying with it. But I would say that, that uh, we, we are behind there. When it comes to the overseas territories, I think there is, there is much more of a co coordinated approach with the UK. 
with the governor's offices in the respective jurisdictions, working with the foreign and um, the SCDO in the UK. So, so there we we are seeing more enforcement action. We are in fact seeing cases now coming out in the courts, albeit not criminal cases, but we are seeing civil style enforcement, um, civil cases that, that that are impacted by by sanctions. So, so we are we are beginning to see that. So it's exactly as you say, Rachel. Yeah, we're in that beginning stage. And I think the pressure will grow to the extent that member states in the EU do not take those those steps to prosecute bad actors. Then we start to see more of what we've seen coming out of OFAC and and, and, and the UK of, of the designation of those financial facilitators. It goes back to the point you mentioned about Nord, Nord Stream there. You know, if, if those countries cannot act to prohibit these activities, then other Third party actors will take action, and I think that that's a terrifying thought to to many uh, in the in the industry, but but a, but a rightful one. Yeah, I certainly from you know, my experience, I know previously one has seen the U.S. authorities take use secondary sanctions where they thought that the domestic jurisdictions weren't doing enough, and I remember trying to think when it was now, but you and I are sitting and uh, having a coffee in Cyprus talking about the latest outreach program from OFAC when they'd actually come over to Cyprus to talk to the Cypriot regulators and help them spread the message about sanctions enforcement from the US perspective. And it's interesting that you say now that that's obviously a message that got through to the Cypriot regulators who now go and have those conversations with their domestic uh, regulatory audience themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and in fact, those those visits of the, of the US have continued as well throughout various European member states. So there is a, there is a saying that when, you know, when OFAC's in town, then something will happen locally, some, some action will happen uh, and, and the government will, it may not be uh, optically necessarily, maybe things that are going on behind the scenes, but it will take steps to ensure that, that you know, regulations that, that should be applied are, are being applied to, as, 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 as you'd expect. Yeah. And indeed, um, we've seen in the last year in the UK, the OFAC has now got a strategic partnership with OFSI, with the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation in HM Treasury, which it ha has been very widely publicised about the fact that they will work together in appropriate cases and will look to do so. And in fact, I was chatting to someone a few months ago who was noting their surprise at the OFAC Christmas party in DC last December to see a number of people from OFSI were at the Christmas party as well. So they're certainly taking efforts, I think, to ensure that the regulators talk to each other across those jurisdictional boundaries. But we've spoken about enforcement. The obvious bigger issue we all face is that of licensing and the time it takes to get licenses from sanctions regulators. And I wonder what your experience has been on that, Aki. Yeah, so I think our experience prior to the invasion, if we if we look at the overseas territories of so the BVI, Cayman Islands, Bermuda in particular, which are jurisdictions we practice in, they historically were, were pretty good at issuing uh, license, processing licenses, getting things turned around. And I think with the with the invasion in February last year, the, the system seems to have, have ground to an almost halt. And there's real difficulty in having any expeditious turnaround of licenses. So that has been a real challenge. Conversely, in the EU, and again, our experience is predominantly in Cyprus, there, it's been the it's been the opposite. I think pre-invasion, the powers that be weren't as familiar with sanctions licensing as they are now, and things were slower. Whereas now, the I have to give credit to the government there that they they have stepped up uh, processes. They are issuing licenses, and there is visibility as to roughly where you are in the queue once the license has been submitted so so that's been interesting but what's what's your experience from with your uk and in particular with your contentious hat on of the licensing process there particularly involving obviously i think it's probably fairly similar to a lot of people which is in one word slow <laughs> 
mm -hmm. obviously have been flooded with license requests. And you see now they're trying to manage that in two ways. One is increasing its workforce. I think obviously it's now up to about 150 people. It was 40 odd February last year, but that it really seems like a drop in the ocean compared to the workload they have on licenses. The other thing that obviously has tried to do is issue general licenses simply to get through the volume. And you know that must be making a difference, particularly with the legal services general license. But nonetheless, they can be incredibly, incredibly slow. And two experiences which are actually at the very opposite ends of the spectrum. Firstly, if we think back to February and March last year and the sale of Chelsea Football Club. And as you can imagine, and quite a number of licenses were needed for that sale of Chelsea by Mr. Abramovich to go through. And there, there was a, I think, a real will amongst all the parties, including government and different government departments to get this through. And it happened relatively quickly. But that is on one end compared to, I think, the day-to-day -day experience of people, in both those who are designated, but also commercial parties who want to be able to, say, execute pre-existing contracts or um, contractual obligations. It can be very, very slow. Um, commercial parties are finding that sometimes they get a quicker response by litigating the issue in the court than they do from officing. And um, certainly I know of at least a, a few cases in the commercial court in London where that has happened, where the commercial court has given a view uh, in circumstances where OFSI has not yet responded to a licensing application in respect of the same conduct that's being litigated. That's quite quite astonishing, really. Yeah, I mean, it's not often where you get a response from the court that is quicker than you would think a less formal uh, one from regulators. But nonetheless, that has been the experience. So you mentioned about the courts being a little bit quicker, surprisingly, than the, the competent authorities here. What are your key takeaways from the growing and evolving body of case law that we're seeing in, in, in sanctions matters? Well, in the UK, I think what the main takeaway is the quality of the judgment and the uh, litigation in the UK courts. I think the, the courts take these very seriously. We have seen the first case relating to a challenge of designation. That's the Synesis case, which involved a company that was designated under the Belarus sanctions regime. Now, Mr. Justice Jay gave his judgment on the court review of that designation decision. And in many ways, actually, it was no great surprises. The designation decision was upheld. It's of interest to, to those of us uh, concerned with the Russian sanctions because the Belarus sanctions regime and designation uh, legal tests are effectively the same, not materially similar. And as I say, the case itself, there weren't really any great surprises as to what reasonable grounds of, for suspicion that means in the context of designations. But what the case didn't really do was touch on the issue of proportionality. And that is the relationship between achieving the purpose of the regime and the application of financial sanctions against the particular designated person. So it will be interesting, really interesting in the Russian delisting cases, the extent to which the courts grapple with that issue of proportionality. So the one takeaway on the designation side is that we actually haven't had the most interesting judicial debates yet, I think. I think proportionality will be a really interesting one. And to see the extent to which the courts take the approach of Lord Sumption and the majority in the Bank Millat case, which was a much more granular analysis of proportionality and the proportionality of listing decisions, or whether they take a more hands-off approach, as we've seen more recently in other national security type cases, such as the case of Shamima Begum, the young woman who left London to go to Syria and then wanted to return to the UK and whose nationality was excluded from so doing and her nationality revoked. So we've had more case law in the commercial court. And again, that has been very interesting to see how sanctions affect 
ongoing litigation, the court's taken a very pragmatic view to that. That was the issue in the National Bank and Mint's case. That was a, an ongoing, long-standing, ongoing litigation involving Russian financial institutions and defendants who it was claimed had defrauded the banks effectively. And this touched on the issue of the of access to justice. The question was whether the sanctions regime effectively prohibited designated financial institution from continuing that litigation. And um, Mrs Justice Cockrell gave judgment in favour of the designated person, per, uh, party in that litigation. Uh, she gave a very interesting judgment that goes into a detailed analysis of the Russian regulations, and in particular, the extent to which sanctions impact upon fundamental rights, here the fundamental right to access to a court. Following actually earlier litigation in, in the UK under the san uh, EU sanctions regime, the case of R&R, &R, um, divorce maintenance case, uh, she held that unless it was very clear, so that explicit words or necessary implication that the sanctions prohibited and restricted access to a court, that being a fundamental right, she would not interpret the sanctions regime in that way. And now that's a case that's subject to appeal. So it, it is a watch this space. Also in the commercial court, one has seen the case of Celestial Aviation in Unicredit Bank. That was a, a commercial case concerning aviation leasing to Russian entities, so the leasing of aircraft and the financial arrangements and the scope of the sanctions prohibitions as regards those financial arrangements under letters of credit, I think, in relation to that, including holding that the sanctions prohibitions did not apply to prohibit the execution of contracts entered into before the restrictive measures came into force, before what was Regulation 28 under the UK-Russia regulations came into force. Um, it will be interesting to see whether the Russian regulations and their application is reflected in other court cases. And indeed, it again, this is a watch this space because there is further litigation involving Russian aircraft leasing between insurers and the aviation lessors, so the leasing companies. So it would be interesting to see how the commercial court deals with that insurance related litigation that we are due to see as well. Thank you for that. I mean, I think just to continue some of those themes in the jurisdictions that we practice, in the case of VTB and, and, and Sergei Teruzzi, which started off in the BVI court system, there again, continuing themes where a law firm had applied to come off the record of acting for, for VTB. Uh, the judge there, Mr Justice Jack, gave quite short shrift to law firms and effectively required them to apply for licenses under the sanctions regimes in order to, to, to be paid for, for legal services, with the, 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 the counter argument being that because of the sanctions, they weren't able to act and therefore they couldn't continue to act. So there, there is certainly a clear backing up of, of, of the rule of law there in, and, and the importance that it is for even, as the, the judge mentioned in, in that case, that even pariahs have rights. So that's clearly a, a continuing theme of, 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 of the court system. And, and, and that was again followed through in, in the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal in, in, in the same, same case that said that the sanctions would have to be, exactly as you say, Rachel, very explicit in nature in order to oust the jurisdiction of the court to determine particular issues. So, so I think, I think that, that is, again, a signal that, that the courts, including in the overseas territories, are really looking in detail at these issues and, and, and trying to grapple with the, the extent of sanctions uh, and, and their constant evolution. So I guess the, the last question that, we, that I've really got for, for you, Rachel, is whether you think that law students at universities in the years to come will, will be doing an elective on, on, on sanctions law and alongside their property law and, and public law modules. Well, I hope so. And certainly, I think that there will be elective courses. And indeed, since I think over 10 years ago, I was teaching a course at LSE on the LLM programme on sanctions. But I also think what we'll be seeing is that sanctions will be permeating, just like it does in our practice, into other courses. So contract law will 
no doubt have an aspect as the extent to which sanctions come under force majeure clauses or mean the parties don't have to execute contractual obligations. Criminal law, the extent to which sanctions prohibitions uh, give rise to criminal offences, public international law, although we're not seeing it at the moment, what uh, is the UN Security Council, its history on using non-forceable measures, so sanctions. Uh, so I think what we will see is sanctions coming into these other law courses and no doubt other providers, not just LSE, are offering sanctions courses in the future. So there we go. It's it's very much a case, I think, of sanctions coming into the mainstream here. So no longer on the periphery is very much core and very much pervasive. So, Rachel, thank you so much for, for, for joining us on, on this first podcast of the, of the new season of, of Expert Review. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat through these issues with you. And thank you very much. And, and just for our listeners benefit, we will be touching again on sanctions in in episode two, where we'll be looking in a bit more detail, again, Rachel, with your expert insight into restrictions on professional services, legal services, and trustees uh, in in the context of, of, of Russia sanctions. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you.